Good morning, Redeemer. My name is Shayla, and I'm going to be reading the scripture this morning. We're going to be in Matthew 7, verses 12 through 23. You can follow along in your Bibles, or it's also on the screen. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law of the, and the prophets. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy, that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way that is hard, that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. All right, Shayla, appreciate that. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Dusty. I'm one of the pastors here, and um, this is an interesting and aggressive passage uh, from Jesus. So we're looking at um, the Sermon on the Mount, 2,000-year-old sermon from Jesus that we've been walking through this whole summer. And, you know, last week we're talking on anxiety from Jesus, and I think that sermon, um, that whether you're here or not, that it was reassuring, comforting, encouraging. It'd be the kind of thing that, so if you weren't a Christian, you would hear, uh, hear Jesus talk about you know, how you deal with things you're worried about, which is every person in here from eight to 88 or anywhere in between or above or below that, every human being has things they're worried about. And he had some incredible things to say about it. And I'm grateful for Jesus entering into those spaces about the things that we really, really are truly worried about. Um, th- this sermon here is really interesting because I, I, I just can't imagine anyone like they may say, eh, I don't still don't know if I believe the Bible, or I still don't know if Jesus really was raised from the dead. But that was actually really great stuff. That uh, that this week is is the kind of thing that tends to make people mad. Uh, that it's the kind of thing that Christians can be embarrassed of as a part of going, I know that we believe that, I don't like it, but I'm kind of embarrassed about it. It can be a reason why, uh, like I was talking with a family member maybe six months ago, and the narrowness of Christianity, the exclusivity of Christianity is exactly the reason why he's kind of walked away from the faith over the years, is that I, I just don't know that um, if that's really, if there's really only only this narrow path to Jesus that that I could buy into that, uh, that it just it feels so wrong to me. And so it can actually be, uh, something that gives a bit of offense to us. And so, um, so yeah, I mean, the, the, I would say that um, just as one thought that in some ways this is validating because um, if you were to think about, if there were to be a being who created everything that um, is the one who, who you know, created everything from subatomic particles to who it is that we are and everything in between in the universe, that it would make sense that if he were, if he existed and if he were to speak to us, then it should stand to reason that there'd be some things that he would communicate that would not be a perfect replication of the society that we're living in at a particular moment. Other times in human history, like the you know exclusivity uh, of of religions, was not a problem. In our society, it actually is. So it shouldn't surprise us that there would be some things that God might reveal about Himself, about how things work. That you're like, ugh. That's uncomfortable. I don't know. I don't know that I agree with that, or that doesn't that doesn't feel like something that I would uh, that I would have come up with on my own. And in some ways, it's like, well, you sh- you should expect God to be different than you would expect Him to be in a lot of different ways. And so here's the the big issue: is that I think that we tend to oftentimes at least, expect what I would describe as a broad or a wide grace from God. And how that plays out for people is there are a lot of us in here that know that we're not perfect and um, that we make mistakes and, um, and know that we probably need some kind of forgiveness. But I think how a lot of us look at it is like, well, I'm not perfect, uh, nobody is, but um, I've got to think that at the end of the day that God's going to you know, forgive. I've got to think you know, that you know, hell 
is for really, really bad people. You know, mass murderers, you know, those people that, you know, killed millions, you know, the Hitlers of the world, maybe defensive backs that pass interfere on third and long, um, pitchers that can't throw strikes. I mean, like the really, really bad people, you know, but I'm not one of those. And so like, we just kind of assume it that, um, that, you know, there's going to be, he's, he's going to give grace, you know, I've done, I've done pretty good and I've fallen a little bit short, but we just tend to assume it. Or if you want to just add on to that, um, I think there's a, this is really growing right now. So there's a certain kind of population bluntly among people who are a little bit older who would see things that way. But I think among the young right now, there's a totally different philosophy and perspective that's, that would be where um, the, the life motto is you do you. And uh, under the you do you kind of philosophy and worldview that there's not really a conception of like I've sinned or I've fallen short and I might need forgiveness. And you wouldn't even feel a need to assume grace in this worldview. On, on this one, you would, you would think more of like really my whole life journey is me discovering who I am and then learning to be authentic to who it is that I am. And so if there are any transgressions, it's not like against like God or something like that. It would be more against myself and I would need to learn to forgive myself when I'm not true to myself, but that'd be it. I mean, that'd be the only rule. So to, to this person, not only is grace uh, assumed like it would be under the first person, but for this one, it's unnecessary. Like you don't really need grace other than self-directed grace. And so uh, Jesus's words here are gonna be really challenging for where a lot of us come at this whole question from. And so we're, we're going to let Jesus be able to tell us how broad or narrow salvation is um, and how uh, even how broad or narrow paths to like fruitful living, like the a life that's actually um, worth living and the, probably the life you want to live, that there's a philosophy that could lead to destruction even in the here and now, and then some that lead to a prospering and a thriving and a flourishing. So um, let's pick up at verse 12. What we're going to see is Jesus is going to address, there's three different blocks of scripture that we're going to move pretty quickly through because it's a decently sizable chunk of, uh, of the Bible today, but three different things that are going to happen. Um, he's going to talk about this narrowness or wideness or broadness of grace and like how salvation and even again, that flourishing life works. And then, uh, then it's going to switch over to talk more of like a metaphor about tree and its fruits. And then at the end, he's going to conclude with, um, with some really kind of scary in some ways talk about some things that we may think make us okay with God that, uh, that may not, at the end of the day, mean a lot. So um, that's what's going to happen. So let's go ahead and start off in verse 12 with what a lot of people call the golden rule. It says, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. So do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And what Jesus is saying here is that um, this one verse, this is going to kind of set up this other conversation here coming in just a moment that uh, the, the summary of all of the Old Testament, which is what the law and the prophets is shorthand for, if you were to sum up all of those laws, I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of laws, and you think about some of them, um, you know, don't steal, don't lie, that, well, okay, um, you may be really tempted to steal or to lie, but do you like it when people um, take things from you after you've worked hard? Um, do you appreciate it when someone steals your identity, you know, digitally or just takes something from yours? You're like, oh man, God, that's sorry. Uh, well, don't do that to somebody else if you wouldn't appreciate that. If you don't appreciate someone lying to you is however tempting it might be to avoid accountability and to bend the truth or only tell part of the truth. Do you appreciate it when people mislead you or when they lie to you? And I know the answer to that. So this is Jesus's point is almost all of those, I mean, really every single law um, like that would, uh, the summary of it all, if you get down to the heart of it, is treat people like you'd want to be treated. And you know, it's a great guide. Um, even if you think about the prophets, a lot of their main burdens, things like the mistreatment of the poor, for instance, it's like, well, okay, put, put yourself in someone's shoes that's powerless. And if somebody else had all the power and they could use their power to keep you where you are, or even to um, continue to have all sorts of injustices because they've got all the courts and they've got all the power and they've got all the money and they can continue to uh, mistreat you because you don't have any, you don't have any recourse. You don't have, you don't have any powerful people, you know, you don't have any money and on and on. Like, how would you feel? And so, okay, so do unto others. That means if you are in a position of power and all that to treat people fairly with justice, with equity, and so on and so forth. I mean, every single thing you can think about in the Law and the Prophets, all is summed up with that. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So uh, now um, we're going to pick up in verse 13. And this is where Jesus is going to begin to introduce that narrowness, broadness, wideness language. 
Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter it, uh, enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Okay, so that's verses 13 and 14. Now, uh, Jesus, when he's talking here, he, he's going to get to the heart um, over and over again. And that's, that's what he's, he's starting to do here is he's saying, look, there's kind of two paths to life. And I think you have to look at this and say, we're talking about our life here and now, and we're talking about our eternal destiny all at once. Because um, you've got language like uh, destruction and you've got language uh, of life. And so I think that, that at least part of what Jesus is talking about is eternal destiny. And so you've got heaven, you've got hell. That's part of it. But I think you're also talking about life here now. There's a path of life that, is, um, that will lead to human flourishing and thriving. And then there's another path that leads to destruction where um, no, matter, no matter what those choices, um, how wise they may seem to us, that um, there's a certain path of life that can lead to like really, really negative things. And so um, you, you can make, I think, a strong case that Jesus is the gate and elsewhere there's another passage in the New Testament where Jesus says that, like I'm, I'm the gate, I'm how you get in. Like you've got to come through me. And later Jesus will begin, this is really early on in Jesus's ministry. So he's not really talking about the cross and the resurrection at this time. Um, that's going to come later, but at another point, you, you can see that's exactly what that means is go, you've got to come through to have eternal life. You come through Jesus, his death, his resurrection. He's the, he's the gate. He's how you get in. Uh, but I think he's also, um, whenever you talk about um, the path, um, that he's, he's the gate, uh, but he's also the path that, uh, that you would be on. So narrow is the path for, is the, the gate to get in, uh, but even, uh, even the, the way, he's also the way, he's, he's the path. And so there's a way of Jesus. Um, and I think it's probably one of the things that uh, Christians in 2023 need to get through our heads is that for a lot of us, depending on the tradition we were raised in, that Christianity and like Jesus and all that was something like you did, like you, um, you, you pray to prayer, you believe these things so that you could get to heaven. And then now you're like, uh, you know, be good or something like that. We don't really know. But the teachings of Jesus, even if you think about the Great Commission, is, hey, you know, make disciples of all nations and teach them to obey all that I've commanded. Like there's a way of Jesus, a path of Jesus. In addition to the gate, he's the way, he's the path. And so um, that's why I think we've, we've got to this whole passage we're looking at today. We're talking about eternity, but we're talking about how we live. And there's a way of living. And in short, if you were to sum up the teaching here, is there's an easy way. There's a path of least resistance that almost everybody around us thinks like, you know, and then there's a narrow path that's hard and it's not the thing that naturally you, you just are going to be, you're just going to find yourself doing without trying. There's a whole world around you that has a different value system. Almost everybody is walking down this other path and uh, you're going to, um, according to what Jesus is saying here, there's a narrow gate to kind of get off this main channel of this river that's just ripping through and there's this gate to get off of that and this other narrow path and it's going to be a hard path, but it leads to life. This one right here is easy everybody's on it, but it leads to destruction, not only eternally, but even in how we live. So on the how you live part, um, you could, um, it could be something like the you do you kind of mentality um, of, of, no, that's what everybody thinks, which is kind of interesting that not I've arrived at this on my own, that I'm going to do me. And it's like, yeah, but what happens if everybody thinks that? Is that all that independent of a thought? Even you do you wasn't very you, you know, it's cultural. And so um, you, you end up having almost everybody around us that is, is doing that and, um, and just even think through like what happens? What happens when everybody's doing you? you know, doing them, doing, that everybody's doing that? It's an interesting question. Or um, you've got, I'll pick some of these up in a minute. Even among our young, so this would be teenagers, you know, college students. What happens if everybody around you is, um, you know, using substances um, to a lot that everybody around you, what you do on Friday and Saturday nights is you drink a bunch, um, you know, you hit vapes in the bathroom at school, um, you're hooking up physically with people, um, you know, just randomly wherever that it's just kind of expected. And that's what everybody's doing. Everybody's doing that. 
And it's like, everybody's like, man, this is incredible. This is how you're going to find life. But what happens if that path is a path that leads to destruction? Not, not only in the next life, but even in now. Like, what happens if this actually leaves you really empty? Um, what happens if everybody you know is just trying to, like, win at life and trying to um, accumulate wins, accumulate money, and uh, just, like, get more things, get more things, and uh, on and on and on. And, but what happens if, in the end, that the love of money is corrosive? Like, that everybody's doing it. Everybody's chasing it. But what happens if in the end, if not only does it not actually fulfill you, but what happens if it actually hollows you out a little bit? And um, there's this other path to a different understanding of money that Jesus is inviting you into. And you could do this with, with almost anything you can imagine. So um, I think that the, the broad gate, uh, the broad path that you're on is just doing what um, the rest of our particular culture um, says, and we just value those things. I think it's the same idea that we learned back this last spring in Romans 12, 1 and 2, where um, we were, went through the book of Romans, and there the Apostle Paul says, hey, let's not be conformed to the world. There's a path. There's a mentality that the world has. Let's not be conformed to that way of thinking, but rather let's be transformed by the renewing of our mind. There's the narrow path, a narrow gate that's a different way of thinking about almost anything um, than, um, than the broad path that almost everybody's on. All right, let's pick up with a second, it's kind of a metaphor that Jesus is going to use with uh, a tree and a life, and just to you know, give you something to look for as we read this, you've got some false teachers who, who may even be saying uh, some true things um, mixed in with some things that aren't false. And, um, and, but how would you know? How would you know if someone is a good, a good teacher or a false teacher? Well, Jesus is gonna help you understand here. Verse 15, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. That means that, um, that they look like they're a sheep. They look like they're a follower of Jesus. Um, they look like that, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. So they've got different intentions. And he said, how are you going to know? Well, you're going to know by their fruits. Uh, or grapes uh, gathered with thorn bushes or figs with thistles. So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that uh, does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So again, you're talking here and now, and you're talking uh, the next life with everlasting life, thrown into the fire, hell, punishment. Verse 20, uh, thus you will recognize them by their fruits. All right, so Jesus, and we're going to come back to this at the end. Jesus is not saying that your works save you. You're like, oh, you better make sure you're doing a lot, um, you know, or, or else, you know. Um, that, that's actually not the point here at all, that he's saying you, you'll recognize what someone is by the, the fruit of their life. And you can't like generate fruit. You can't just think real hard and, you know, grapes start popping out. Like it's not how it works, that it's a reflexive natural product of what someone is. There's going to be fruit um, that will will come out that will match someone, uh, someone's internal reality. And I love the fact that Jesus, from the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, has went to the deep places to the human soul. What you would expect a religious teacher to say is, um, hey, you need to start giving more money and then it'll be fine. You know, if you get 10%, then you're good to go or something. You, you just expect, hey, if you make this pilgrimage, go, go to this one place and really prove that you're really serious, then you'll be fine. Um, you know, or you, if you abstain from this certain drink or food, then like you, you'll really prove that you're hardcore. But it's actually not what he says. He's getting to the heart and saying, "Look, I'm, I'm not. I'm not so much focusing on a particular thing you do." I'm talking about the depth of your soul. Like, what are you? What do you really believe? Not, not false teacher, what do you say? You know, uh, not, not what you're communicating and how big your following is and how big your social media presence is and what kind of private jet you got or whatever. Like, I, none of that stuff matters. Like, I want, to talk about, I want to talk about what's in your soul. What do you really love at the end of the day? Uh, what, what, what's the fruit? And uh, there's a very narrow way, if you want to pull this back to what we just learned about, there's a narrow way and it comes down to what you are and then the fruit flows from that, a depth of soul. That's where Jesus is pointing us here. It's a very narrow path, the broad path. It's about what you say, it's about what you do. But here he's like, yeah, you're gonna do things, but it's gonna flow from depth to soul. Now, I do wanna make a point here that, um, that look, Christians that love Jesus very much sometimes uh, do really dumb things. And I'm probably the leader of the pack in those kind of things. And so we'll do really dumb things. And Jesus is saying here, he's actually not trying to make you doubt your salvation and um, probably a lot of you are doubting your salvation, probably shouldn't. 
um, that those that pray doubt it the most, that you just really want to please Jesus deeply and badly, really, you really do. You want to you please him, and whenever you fail, like you take it really personally, and you do feel guilt, you do feel shame, and this is why Jesus died. That's the whole point, is we need forgiveness, we need grace, uh, but we don't assume it, uh, but it begins to have a transforming impact on the depth of our soul, deep, deep down, and then fruit emerges over time. Not 100%, but it's uh, that will be known by the fruit. And it makes sense if we really believe that our only hope is in Jesus and the way of Jesus is the way to life. If that's the only thing that we can do, that if we really believe that, that, um, that, that our life will begin to adjust and our mind will begin to be transformed by the renewing of our mind through the promises, through the spirit, through God's word. Um, that's how that happens. Okay, so just as a few examples of this, if you think about fruit, again, Christians can sometimes buy into these things. So just because you've, for a season, have thought this way and lived this way, it's very possible to be a Christian and latch onto these things. But because this passage is talking about life now as well as life later, um, just think through some of the examples we've already had in this passage. Something like, um, like an ideology that says, hey, look, I'm, I'm going to do me. So let's just think about the fruit. Think about the fruit of what it looks like. If at the depth of your soul, it's like, man, I'm on a quest to discover the authentic me and then to live according to that truly for my whole life. That, that's my whole life purpose. Is first of all, um, what's the fruit? What's the fruit of that? And I'd say first that, um, like, how's it working out for you? It's actually a lot of pressure. Like, how would you discover the authentic you that isn't just like everybody else thinking like everybody else, even on that question about me, do me? Like, how would you, how would you discover it? Do you need to take a gap year? Do you need to, like, it's a lot of pressure. What would be the real me and how would I know when I've discovered it that's like authentically unwound from the culture around me? Um, that, that's actually really tough. And what happens when you have a whole society of everybody around us that's doing um, each person being authentic to themselves, living for themselves, and um, that you're kind of always, everybody around them is uh, like supporting actors and background vocalists for them being the star in the show. Like what happens when everybody's living that way and we work that way, we enter into dating and marriage relationships that way and we have friendships that way and we work with each other and we start businesses and we have customers and we think like this. Like what's the fruit? Like how, what ends up being the end result if you live life that way? Uh, is this a compelling, does that lead to life do you think societally? Would that lead to life for you if you live that way? Or let's even go back to Jesus's golden rule do unto others as um, you would have them do unto you. If someone else was living primarily for themselves, um, would that make you feel like so seen? You're like, oh man, I just love how you do you and that um, you like me provided that I make you feel uh, good about you. I feel so seen and honored. Uh, that is truly, um, truly sweet that you see it that way. Like, of course you wouldn't. Um, the, like, you would love and appreciate someone that wants to enter into your space and wants to understand you and even where you're different and, and like, really understand you, really see you, and really love you uh, where you are. Like, that's what you would want, right? Um, or, um, think about, um, I mentioned earlier, like that, the, like the teen or the college party scene. Again, every, what everybody's doing, what everybody's doing is uh, misusing substances. By the way, just as an aside on this, I was reading a, a, um, a, like a chapter in a book on this this week that, um, that it's easy to say, yeah, kids are kids. And I mean, I drank a lot too in college, for those of you that did or something like that. Like they're saying now, like it's a multiple more of alcohol that's being consumed at the college level when people get together for parties. It's not like, yeah, we're having a couple of beers. It's like a lot of alcohol. And it's actually creating a lot of problems in the courts because as you can imagine, um, these like super over the top drunken parties and sex are all kind of like, you know, like intermixed in there. And like consent is like super tricky to figure out whenever you've got um, both parties that are like double and triple um, the legal limit and that kind of thing. And, and so like there's all these things that are going on. And when you look at that and you're like, yeah, but that's what everybody's doing. And everybody is drinking a bunch and everybody is just kind of whatevering. And when you look at that, you're like, man, this is the life. I'm not talking about over the short run, over a weekend. But when you look at that, using each other's bodies, using substances to kind of get out of their mind and um, where, uh, where you are, aren't thinking as clearly as you normally would and so on and so forth, has this led to life to people? People you know that are alcoholics, people that you know, and there'll be several recovering alcoholics that are here today. When you look at that life you used to live, you're like, is there any part of you that thinks, ah, man, those are the good old days. I mean, I haven't met a recovering alcoholic yet um, that said anything other than, uh, man, 
what I wouldn't give to never have taken a sip. Um, and even like everybody you know is vaping. And so now you've got to go get a hit on a vape, um, you know, at every restroom break at school because you're addicted to nicotine. And it's like, does that look like freedom and life to you? And, and so you can just look at the whole picture of it. You can look at the fruit of decisions and look at a path that someone's on, this broad path that everyone is doing. Does it lead to say, again, I love how you're using my body to make you feel good. I just feel, again, so honored and loved and treasured. And of course not, you know? Like this whole path, when you really think about it objectively through, it doesn't lead to life. And so this is what Jesus is saying, is you're gonna know not only teachers, but we're gonna know all of us by our fruit. Yes, Christians can sometimes think that life is over here, but even now, I wonder if the Spirit might be just wooing us back. And it may not be any of the things I've talked about. Maybe it's money and the accumulation of things. It might be, it might be your reputation in the community. It might be, uh, it might be politics, um, where now it's like, well, that other team, they go scorched earth, so we're going to go scorched earth. We're going to suspend all Christian principles of how we're going to treat one another because uh, might makes right, and we got to, you know? And so, I mean, it could be a million things, and that's what everybody's doing, so therefore it's fine. There are a million things like that, and he's saying, no, 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 there's a narrow path. Let's be transformed. Let's think differently about, about what we're doing. So um, let's look at the last part that might be the most aggressive and challenging of all. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, um, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, workers of lawlessness." All right, so this is that assumed grace or even grace is unnecessary uh, thing that Jesus is pushing on right here. And you've really got, uh, got something we've got to identify on the front end. He is not saying, um, he's not saying that he wants people to be afraid, that he's not trying to scare you. If you have a genuine faith in him that you're like, oh man, I need to do more. Let's think about it. Think about all the things he's been saying. Is, is the overall thrust of this passage been that you need to do more? Is that actually what he's saying? Or is it more of like an identity and a deep belief and him peeling back pretense and getting to the heart? And I think that's more of what it is. And certainly there are things that we do, there are things that we do that flow from that. Um, that's sort of the whole point. But he's not actually trying to make us like doubt our salvation. Um, if you think of something like John three sixteen, that um, that he, he says that, look, you're gonna have eternal life for everyone who believes uh, believes in Jesus, that, um, that it's God's only son and whoever believes in him, him wouldn't perish but have eternal life. But what he's going to do here, though, is get to the deep places and not just say, uh, say that we believe something or point to a few religious works and say, I'm fine. Um, there's two things he does. He says, look, there's some of you that say, Lord, Lord. So you say that you have a profession of faith. And because Jesus goes to the deep places, that whenever we appear before him someday, that um, it, it's not gonna be enough for us just to say, look, um, look, I, 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 here I am, Lord, Lord, I see you, you're Lord Jesus, and, and um, I hear the words, but when he knows that that's never been uh, true at the depth of your soul, like that's not what kind of tree you are, and furthermore, there hasn't been fruit that would be consistent with that, and this is scary for me because I think in, in Lubbock, that overwhelming majority of Lubbock, that, I mean, I'd say 75% would say that they're Christians, almost everybody, you know, like you talk to them. Now, there are a few that know that they're not, uh, but there's loads and loads of people, most people even, who think that they are. And I remember like seeing this, like I've seen this a million different times, but I remember in particular, there's one time I was um, meeting with a dad of a, a kid that, I didn't even coach his kid, but he was in kind of the circles that we ran in and he wanted to meet with me. His life was kind of unraveling and it was a mess, you know, have to be escorted off of fields and stuff like that, fighting and all sorts of things. And, um, you know, he's talking about all the things that were going on, felt hopeless. And so I shared the gospel with him and told him about the hope of Jesus' death and resurrection. And there's a different path, a different life available to him. And he just looked at me. He's like, yeah, yeah, I believe that stuff. You know, it's like, it's like in a sense, almost everybody around us like says Jesus, you know, yes, to Jesus in a way, like there's, there's our words at least would say that's where we are, but on a, on a deep level of our values and what we're putting our hope on and what we're putting our trust on, even, even our identity about um, who it is that we are if we're sons and daughters of God, that sometimes uh, our, words, uh, our words betray the reality of the soul. And that's what Jesus is getting at, that again, he's different than every other religious teacher that would say, yeah, yeah, just you know, sign right here, 
and you just sign your name right there and identify as a certain religion and that's going to be fine and do a few of these things. He's like, no, 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 I want to get to the depth of soul. Like, what do you, what do you really think saves the soul? Because your whole life says it's something different. The second thing, if the first thing he's pointing out is these people are saying, Lord, Lord, their words uh, aren't actually reflecting what's true in their soul, is the second thing is that we're doing things, particularly some performative religious acts um, where um, you're doing all these uh, things that could be serving the church, giving to the church. Um, it could be uh, even being in a leadership role, being a pastor, being a deacon, serving. Uh, it could be a lot of things within the church. But even more broadly than that, it could also be uh, just doing a lot of good things. Is I think there's a lot of us that are going to show up to heaven. I hear it all the time and or show up to, you know, the, the judgment seat uh, before, uh, after we die and before you, you know, you enter into your eternal destiny and that we imagine ourselves um, kind of explaining to Jesus that, no, 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 look, look, look what all I did for my kids. I drove them around and, you know, I worked hard. I was a good employee and I was a nice person and I'd wave at people like this, something with the truck, you know, when they'd go by and, you know, and I, I didn't have any, um, you know, interference penalties on 3rd and 25, and I didn't do, I did really good stuff. You know, you should be, you should have been happy that, that I'm like, I'm here. I'm going to bring the reputation level of this whole place up. And uh, what Jesus is saying is, is like what you do, whether it's a religious performative thing or these other good things that we do, that doing some external things, no matter how like religious or anything else, like that it's still, it, what about the soul? And that's what Jesus is getting into is, yeah, but what do you love? Like, who are you? And where's your trust? And where's your hope? And where are you leaning towards? And do we assume grace or not think we need it at all? Or do we think that the grace of Jesus and his cross is our only hope and it's the only way out? And so here's the thing. Um, here's where I wanna encourage you is that um, in that last day, and for that matter, even in how we live our life and what's gonna be good, profitable, helpful versus what's gonna be destructive and um, awful that it's not so much like, look at the true me, um, that that's not gonna be impressive to Jesus. It's also not gonna be, um, look at what I said, uh, that's external. It's also not gonna be, look at what I did, that's also external, that what Jesus is getting at is, yeah, but what did you love? And did you go through the gate? Um, was Jesus the goal all along or was it you building a big you? Um, what, what was the goal here? And uh, there's this narrow path that we only access. It's Jesus and we come through the cross, we come through the resurrection and then there's a way of Jesus. We're discipled into this way of Jesus where we live with a different set of values than the world around us. And it's narrow and it's gonna be hard and you're gonna see all these other people and it looks like they're living their best life Life, and you're going to wonder if that life would be better than the one that you're on. And Jesus is saying, look, this is, this is who it is that we are in our depth. And it's not what you say. And it's not even so much what you do, but this deep, deep love and faith of the soul. Uh, and that Jesus knows, and it's going to come down to not what you've done, but he's going to say, I never knew you if it's not true. And it comes down to what Christ has done, his death and resurrection. Him knowing you is the most important thing in the whole universe, being known by God. And the way that you're known by God is again, through that narrow gate, through the cross and through the resurrection. And my hope for you is that every person here would walk through that narrow gate, both initially in salvation, by believing in Jesus' death and resurrection, and not just with your mouth, um, not just something you say, but isn't really true, uh, and not just doing some performative religious acts, but like in depth of soul, um, and that you not only would go through that gate, but even on the way of Jesus, a path of discipleship, following Jesus at every turn, even whenever you're not seeing it, even when you're not sure if it's actually better, even when it seems like much less fun, even when that path is hard, um, that we would cling to him through all of our days. And even when we step off of that path, that we would come back uh, and be reminded of the beauty and the grace of Jesus. So let's stand together and I'm gonna pray um, that we would walk with him in that way. Lord, would we cling to your grace as our only hope, um, not, as, um, not as something performative in a couple things we would do, or in what we say with our mouth only that's hollow and not accurate, not real, uh, but in depth of soul, that there would be a deep sense of belief that our only hope would be in you, um, that some would, um, for the first time, enter through that gate, and that there'd be many, many others that as we all are tempted to do that have veered off the path, but would return to the narrow path, the path that leads to life, your good path that's good for our soul. So Lord, would you, um, would you do that in us and through us? And I pray that in Jesus' name, amen. 